Uh, sorry, everyone. I don't usually sound like this. So I think I can blame Melbourne's volatile weather for that one. But um, firstly, thank you to FFA, FFA for the initiative of putting this together and giving me a platform to present to you a topic that I'm very passionate about. And this is reimagining women's football. And for me, this is all about how we put more of a female focus, so a gender lens on the current framework that we operate within football. So I think we can all agree that the sleeping giant of women's sport has awoken. And with that, we have a host of new challenges and opportunities that have emerged. I want to pose a question as to how elite women's sport, but more specifically football, is viewed operationally, structurally, fundamentally and practically. I feel that that question I feel that that question can be better explored with an understanding of how the players envision their football career. So it started when I was about three or four with my dad in the backyard of my grandma's house, basically. Um, played with my dad and brother, and from there we just kind of joined clubs, joined academies, and I fell in love with the game, really. Uh, I was inspired by um, men's players to begin with, so I went for Chelsea FC, um, and Didier Drogba was my favourite player. So. Um, he used to wear like gloves with like little fingertips cut off and so I basically replicated that from basically my junior career. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much what inspired me and then I just kept going and kept pushing through. And, um, I think I've always wanted football to be my career ever since I can remember. Um, whenever I was in school and teachers asked me what I wanted to be, it was always a footballer. So yeah, that's pretty much all I want to do. Uh, pretty much my whole life has been focused towards getting into the Matildas. Um, yeah, I dropped out of school at year 10 level because I just wanted to focus fully on football at that stage. Um, I'm still doing schooling online at the moment, but yeah, I just, I don't know, everything's towards it. It's all football 24-7 and I mean, I wouldn't have it any other way really. I've made some amazing friends through football and probably like ones that I'll have for the rest of my life. So it doesn't really phase me that much that I miss out on the other, I guess, normal parts of life. It was a great thing to be a part of that first year at Melbourne City, um, to get kind of a taste of what football is really like. Um, I had time to really focus on every part of my game and push forward. Yeah, I don't know, it was just such a good experience. Yeah, it's definitely so important to have the international players playing alongside us as well. It makes the league a lot better and it makes us as younger players um, a bit more aware to what it's like around the world as well. I think um, to start off with, just to get to the season longer so we can all have time, more time together to gel as a group because once the season starts, it's kind of already over by the time we're all gelling and yeah, it's. It's hard at the moment. Uh, I definitely want to make the Matilda squad. Um, my ultimate goal is to go to a World Cup, hopefully win it one day. I think with the players that are coming through the system at the moment, it's definitely possible that we could end up winning a World Cup or an Olympic medal one day. Um, I, I do want to play overseas, so I do want to play for Chelsea FC ladies. That would be one of my top goals as well, so yeah. So, operating within the current women's football model, will Alex Chidiak reach her full potential and achieve her aspirations? Or does women's football need to be reimagined and viewed through a completely different lens, a gender-specific lens? I believe so, and I'm going to present the reasons as to why. Firstly, as much as I hate to say it, it's a man's game, and the majority of elite female sporting competitions are a direct replication of the male framework. Secondly, as females, our physiology and biological makeup are completely different to that of men, which I will speak to on a broader scale shortly. The laws of football were codified in 1863 and very little has changed since. If anything, technical adjustments adapted to suit the modern game Yet women's rights have progressed, societal laws changed and rules modified. 
This list only touches on the significant societal changes in women's rights and the pioneering women that have led the way. So why have the laws of the game stayed stagnant and not been adapted or shaped to comp complement the way women play the game? Would modifications to the norm ensure a longer playing career, reduce the chances of injury, even provide a better standard of play? Tennis and golf have both made changes to accommodate for the way the female game is played, with women fighting out the best of three sets in Grand Slam tournaments instead of five, which is common practice in the male game. Women also receive 10 minute breaks between the second and third set if conditions reach a certain humidity. Some might argue that this displays overt sexism through inequality of effort, but I'm the first person to stick my hand up in staunch support for female athletes' capability of going the distance. However, let's view this through a different prism. Has this format instead assisted in reducing player injury, ensuring career longevity, protecting player health and well-being, and maximising player output? The WTA tour itself was built off the back of Billie Jean King, who had the foresight to not only ensure that the best women were all competing on the same circuit, but had a voice through the Women's Tennis Association. This would become the catalyst that would lead to equality in pay and the establishment of an active players' council advocating for female player interests, changes in scheduling and dealing with current issues affecting the women's game. Golf has made many adjustments to account for the physiological differences that exist between males and females. The golf balls used by female players have a softer compression rating to accommodate for the slower swing speed of female players. There is also a difference in the clubs used by females, being lighter, shorter and more flexible. Female players also play the course from its shortest length, off the forward tee, in no way making the hole any easier to play, but reducing the hole, like, hole length by 25% of the male difference. Differences in physiology and biology. When referencing these differences in physiology and biology, that exist between males and females, we can begin to delve deeper and identify the specific health challenges that exist. Conceptually, these challenges can be allocated into two categories of cause. Sex differences, these are the anatomical and physiological differences. Gender differences, this refers to the sociological, environmental, physiological influences that affect women's opportunities and access to sport and health services. Furthermore, is acknowledging who is directly affected. These are both current and retired athletes. As the manifestations from sex and gender differences impact both parties to differing degrees. The unique health and medical challenges. The medical literature suggests that the current, that current, retired, and, uh, current, that current and retired athletes' unique health and medical challenges can be attributed to four key areas. First is musculoskeletal differences. Non-contact anterior cruciate ligament damage is 3.5 times more likely in females during, due to the difference in neuromuscular adaptations and the biomechanics related to landing techniques. There is promising evidence that these patterns can be prevented or corrected by participation in ACL prevention and appropriate strength and conditioning. The duty then lies with those charged with delivering such programs and their awareness of female athletes' predisposition. Infertility and pregnancy. Intense physical activity contributes to the delay of late onset menstruation along with cycle irregularity and the leading cause of infertility in women. Exercise during pregnancy and transition back post childbirth requires research and professional guidance. Policies and frameworks need to be developed and put in place that educate and protect athletes both pre and post pregnancy. The interrelationship between menstruation and exercise Intense physical activity and, and delayed menstruation in adolescence prevents the natural buildup of bone density. This is the leading cause of stress fractures and early onset of osteoporosis later in life. Players' training loads need to be monitored and adjusted to account for the short-term and long-term impacts. Body image and eating disorders. There is an increase in these disorders in young athletes. Prevention, identification and management becomes integral during a player's career. AFLW is a live example of the direct and very real ramifications both from a legal and player and safety wellbeing perspective that can be amplified by failing to account for these unique health and medical challenges. 
The AFLW is a direct replication of AFL. Changes were made to the model and rules used within the AFL men's competition. However, these changes were made to drive greater ma match aesthetics and did not reflect the sex or gender challenges mentioned. Public available data indicates that there were more injuries sustained in the AFLW than the AFL. This presents an immediate legal and governance obligation on the AFL Commission in the management of the sport and ensuring player safety and well-being. Recognising that the cause of industry, injuries sustained among AFLW players goes beyond those that are inherent in the sport, but attributed to sex and gender differences. Initiatives to reduce their occurrence lie in player education on injury prevent, prevalence, correct execution of core skills, and on the consequences that come with failing to do so, and verifying rules to reduce the number of gratuitous contacts. Players are relying on their governing bodies to implement frameworks that reflect a duty of care stemming from careful consideration of female-specific research. PFA research has shown that the average age of World Championship winning teams is 29 years. On average, elite female athlete players are leaving the game at 25. With the current rate of player churn, how are the Matildas going to host the, host the Women's World Cup? Australian players have indicated that the main reasons they leave the game early is due to financial strain, lack of professional career opportunities and to start a family. How do we keep players in the game, increase the talent pool and create a meaningful career for those involved? We build a vision in consultation with the players that moves them from amateur to professional and aligns all stakeholders. This vision has three very clear objectives becoming world, championship, world champions, Olympic gold medalists, and launching the best domestic league in the world through the W League. To achieve these aspirations, the framework has three core focus areas, a collective bargaining agreement, a redeveloped competition structure, and, a, and sustainable revenue streams. The outcome has been the negotiation of a collective bargaining agreement that has not only built a strong alliance between all parties involved, the players, the FFA and the clubs have set the foundations to grow the players' collective hopes of building a professional career as a football and giving the players a clear voice in what that future looks like. Put simply, professionalism relates to the financial remuneration to players over and above their expenses. However, more broadly, the notion of professionalism needs to be considered on a range of factors. This includes the employment status, the competition structure, the hours of work, the quality of infrastructure and player access, use and exploitation of the player's intellectual property, and the nature of the support personnel engaged by the clubs. With the move towards professionalism comes a new level of expectation and accountability at both the clubs and the players. The clubs, along with the competition administrator, uh, administrator's obligations are threefold. One, the discharge of their duty of care to the female players contracted within their competition. Two, is the assignment of the ethical and governance standards that have institutionalised and the compliance with the statutory obligations as employers. In response, the players must honour their contracts in their entirety as employees, adhere to the club's expectations and act and conduct themselves in a professional manner. This forms an education piece for the players and the league itself meeting the thresholds required to be considered professional. How does the professional pathway look for female players? Do we want what historically exists for, for male players? PFA research shows that the current male pathway is all about targeting them young, getting them into the system and spitting them out. As indicated, they, do, they debut at the age of 21, will turn through three or more clubs over the span of their career and have hung up their boots between the ages of 24 to 27. Is this what we want for our female players? When looking at the general population and female player statistics, there is a strong correlation with the academic ability and thirst for education. Women make up 60% of undergraduates, girls have consistently higher school grades, girls focus on process and mastery of skills, 28% of W League players have completed masters or bachelor degrees. This then needs to be reflected in the female career path. Can we provide a resource charged with managing this process, finding flexible education and employment options that complement the players' football commitments? 
Do we restrict access to players' hours that allow them that, that allow them for them to attend and complete their off-field pursuits? Do we mandate the players between the age of 13 and 16 have their expectations managed and contact hours restricted to ensure that they don't burn out before reaching their potential? What about those players who just want to be professional footballers? Can we support them and help them find employment by connecting them to international leagues and managing their W League and international careers? With the aim being to remove the stress of sourcing employment and providing them with a clear career outlook. How do we ensure that we have the appropriate mechanisms in place to achieve a female-specific football model? To strip it back further, what do those mechanisms include? The key drivers in all of this is coaching. This is the introduction of coaching accreditations that require prospective coaches to acquire skills that safeguard the health and well-being of female athletes, such as appropriate training routines to minimise ACL injuries or training load optimisation to avoid stress fractures in adolescent players. Human performance. The governing body and the clubs have to ensure that the rigour applied to biometric data collection within the men's game is equally applied to female players to ensure that, firstly, the appropriate level of human performance support to current players is in place, and secondly, there is ongoing female-specific research to support the development of a compulsory framework which matches the needs of female players. The competition structure itself, does, this, does the replication of a 38-week male season fit into the female game, or is there a better way of doing it? Does the current structure fit, given the smaller playing pool, complementing their existing global domestic leagues and offering an avenue for players to maximise their earning potential? Can we look for ways to increase the games played without increasing the season length? Are midweek games an option, both from a structural and broadcast perspective? What about dual registration? Is there value in having players contracted to two or more clubs simultaneously? Does it cut through the bureaucracy and provide the players with job security, peace of mind and secular employment? Governments and administration. I don't think that anyone here would disagree with the need to ensure that women's football has a voice. But what does that voice look like? And even more important, how is that voice supported? You can't be what you can't see. And with that comes the overriding fact that female administrators, coaches, referees and volunteers are the lifeblood that needs to be injected into football. What is the best way to achieve this? Are gender equality regulations within policy documents and quotas the most effective means? Are there other live examples that could be implemented to ensure gender equality? The Rooney Rule is one that stands out for me. The Rooney Rule was adopted in 2002 by the NFL to provide opportunity for minority candidates to be interviewed for head coaching and general manager positions, resulting in a percentage of African American head coaches jumping from 6% to 22%. The English FA are looking at piloting the rule through their league clubs as only three out of 92 have minority coaches, even less so in the Premier League. Variations of the rule have been adapted by other industries to reduce unconscious bias by diversifying both the interview panel and applicant pool when interviewing for key positions. The rule does not guarantee job entitlement, instead ensures a broad candidate pool and a fair chance to all. This is a simple yet effective mechanism that should be applied within our game from grassroots to governance for all decision making positions. This is such an exciting topic and one that I feel passionate about. We have only really just started to scratch the surface. As we begin to crystallise these concepts and delve deeper into conversation, the opportunity to build a football model that supports the biology, physiology of females and provides a female voice and involves females within the decision making process can be instrumental in the way that not only women's football but women's sport develops in this country. I'll leave you with what exactly can be achieved by reimagining women's football.
me a sweat. I only want you. on earth now falls Australia home after the Matildas defeated Germany 2-1 in that gripping World Cup final. I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up the day is a bum. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Are there any questions? Yes, we do have one. Sorry. You, you're back up. <laughs> So you mentioned ACL injuries. Um, do Sorry, could you stand up just so <laughs> Kate can me? see where you are? I'm, I'm oh, lost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned coaching education. Um, should it be different from men to women? The uh, education from coaching? For coaches, because if there's certain special care for ACL injuries at a certain age, mm -hmm. do you think that coach we're doing that the coaching education is being done wrong? I don't necessarily think the education is done wrong. It's more around what they're being educated on. So I think obviously, as I mentioned, there's, there's health challenges that affect males and females differently. I think that needs to be accounted for and coaches need to be aware of that. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Alex Donaldson from La Trobe University. The whole issue of uh, injury prevention and performance and the, the link of those two things together I think is there's more and more data coming out that shows if you keep your players healthy you're more likely to win games. There's a good UEFA data on that. But the most powerful image I've ever seen was presented by Kate Beerworth of a photo of the, uh, I think it was the 2014 Matilda uh, Asia Cup winners. And she put up the photo and there were 17 ACL injuries amongst a group of 14 players. Yep. That was 17 years of development, football development lost in that group of elite players. And uh, that's really something that we need to address to come to cut across every outcome that uh, FFA and FFE is looking, looking to achieve, I think, from participation to performance. Yeah, no, I agree. And there's, there's simple, like, I guess, preventative things that can be put in place to accommodate for that. And it's just giving that education to those that are charged with looking after the players as to what we can do to prevent those things. And I was one of those. So 2011, I did my ACL as well. So I've been there, done that. I just have a question, and it's regarding the community clubs, uh, especially uh, we, we, we're very aware of the players, male players do get paid pretty good money, but females don't at all. You guys are looking into that at all, especially in PLs? Yeah, um, with the role that I'm currently in the moment, we look after the professional cohort of players, but that's definitely something that we need to look into. and. It's, it's a challenge at the moment because we are, are fairly small in the association and I'm not, not trying to make excuses at all, but I think all players need to be looked after in that space. We just have to work out how we can resource it and do it as by the most effective means possible. Anyone else? Last one over here. Uh, Kate, effectively at the moment there's almost an alliance between the W League and the NWSL in the United States which enables you know with coordination of seasons to and to to offer a, a year round package yep. for quite a lot of players and uh, I'd put it that it's actually strategically quite good for both USA and Australian players uh, in uh, and and those leagues in almost uh, a counterbalance to European opportunities. So can you give us your thoughts about uh, that interchange of players between leagues and what it offers and how we can best take advantage of it? Yeah, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. We kind of are taking advantage of it in the current structure of the W League because our players can go and play in the WNSL and then come back and play in the W League. And it's great for those also international players within that league as well that then want to come and play into the 
W League. So it's an attractive career path. But I think our ultimate goal is to get the W League to stand on its own two feet. We want a fully fledged home and away series. And if we're biting into other leagues, so that limits the girls' opportunities, but then we've got a competition that supports them financially and looks after that. I think that's where we, we want to take it to. It's going to take some time, but while we can kind of maximise their playing opportunities and also earning opportunities, I think the way it kind of works at the moment is favourable for both. Kate Gill, thank you very much. Thank you.